Welcome to a special edition of Medicine of Meadville. I'm Dwayne Kohler from Meadville Medical Center, and we are coming to you today from the Center for Community Wellness. And we are back with our Ask the Expert series, and today we're talking about sports specialization. So I think that's an important topic. Stay tuned. March is National Athletic Training Month, and the National Athletic Training Association was first founded in 1950, with the first meeting being in Kansas City with 200 members in attendance. Since then, the National Athletic Training Association has grown to 43,000 members with a mission to represent, engage, and foster the continued growth and development of the athletic training profession and athletic trainers as unique healthcare providers. We are all members of Crawford County Sports Medicine here at the Meadville Medical Center. Our program began in 1998 and at the time employed two full-time athletic trainers covering eight of our local high schools. We have grown <clears throat> to include a current clinical staff of four full-time athletic trainers, one part-time athletic trainer, one full-time physical therapist athletic trainer, and we now cover 10 local high schools. <clears throat> so what is an athletic trainer? An athletic trainer is a healthcare professional that has attained a minimum of a bachelor's degree from a Katy accredited athletic training education program. And very recently, the push within the profession is actually to make um, the minimum requirement an entry-level master's degree. <clears throat> Once you have completed your formal education, you will have a knowledge base in injury prevention, clinical evaluation and diagnosis, immediate care, treatment, rehabilitation and reconditioning, as long as some organization and administrative background and skills and professional responsibility. Once you have completed all of that, you are required to pass a national certification exam, which is known as the BOC. And then to be able to practice as an athletic trainer, you must maintain licensure in accordance with the state in which you are choosing to work. Here in Pennsylvania, we are licensed through the State Board of Medicine. And finally, um, to maintain your certification, you also have to complete 50 continuing ed units every two years. Specifically to us here at Crawford County Sports Medicine, we are also all American Heart Association CPR instructors and have extensive extensive training in concussion management. Um, while we are often doing daily practice coverage, game coverage of the interscholastic sports at the high schools, we have also developed um, some injury prevention programs for the summer and some community outreach for concussion education. Um, like Ann said, I'm Brianna O'Brien. This is Whitney, Courtney, and Carrie. Um, Mandy is our part-time athletic trainer who's unable to be with us, and Mike Carr is our physical therapist, athletic trainer, and supervisor of Crawford County Sports Medicine. We were putting this together, and just, just amongst the four of us, there's actually 32 years of athletic training experience combined for us this evening. Whitney's going to speak briefly just on what actually we're talking about tonight in what is sports specialization. Okay, so as you can see, uh, sports specialization, just a very basic definition, is year-round intensive training. We're talking eight plus months out of the year, um, participating solely in a single sport, and that is at the exclusion of participating in other sports. Youth sports specialization has become a growing trend in athletics today. Youth athletes are committing to playing a single sport earlier and earlier. The growing trend is that more is better with year-round dedication to that single sport. The athletic trainers at Crawford County Sports Medicine have seen a significant increase in this mindset over the past few years at our local high schools and also in youth athletics. It is worth noting that research in this specific area is growing but is currently pretty limited. However, the athletic trainers have formed a specific opinion stemming from our daily work in athletics and our research on the subject. This evening we seek to present general information on the benefits and risks of sports specialization, including injury and mental health considerations, research findings, and exploring the subject from multiple points of view. 
I would like to talk about some statistics regarding sports specialization tonight. In doing some research on the topic, um, I did find some stats that were pretty important and stood out to me regarding some of the information about specialization is detrimental to some of these athletes playing sports. As many as 70% of kids that play sports will actually discontinue playing their sport by the age of 13. Um, and that's possibly related to the specialization and the pressure that they receive from everyone. There are only 1% of high school athletes that receive scholarships to continue their sport in college. At least 50% of athletic injuries are rela related to overuse. And again, may be correlated to the, cor to the specialization. Between 3 and 11% of high school athletes will compete at a college level, which I thought was pretty interesting to find. Um, it does seem like a very low number of athletes that will continue their, their sport in college. And there are between only 0 0.03 and 0.5% of high school athletes that will reach a professional level. Early sport specialization is increasing dramatically, especially over the recent years. And there were a reported number of 77.7% .7 of athletic directors that reported that there has been an increase in the specialization in the schools. One of the biggest reasons driving sport specialization is the idea that focusing on one sport is going to increase your performance. Researcher f researches, researchers excuse me, are finding that with early sport specialization, it is associated with an increased rate of overuse injury, burnout, decreased motivation to continue your sport, and eventually kids are stopping their sport completely. One important study that I found was done in the NFL in 2017, and they looked at the number of first round picks. There were 32 that they, two athletes that they looked at, and of the 30 athletes out of 32, of that, 30 of them were multi-sport athletes in high school. They participated in football, track and field, baseball, basketball, and lacrosse. So that's showing that these professional athletes did not specialize in football before they became professional. In a study during, done during, in the NCAA, they looked at division one, two, and three athletes and this was in 2015 out of 21,000 athletes. Of these athletes, 71% of Division I football players played other sports, 88% of Division I men and 83% of Division I women lacrosse players played other sports, 91% of Division I male and 87% of Division I female runners played sports other than the ones they participated in college. And this just shows between both studies that at the college level and also the um, professional level, there is a low rate of specialization. So it's showing that you don't have to specialize in order to be good at the sport you're choosing and, and in order to get you further in the sport. Um, there are some programs that were developed to help decrease the detrimental effects of specialization. And the first one I wanted to talk about were long-term athlete development programs that was developed in the 1900s. For the framework of the program, it involves about five different steps. And again, this is just trying to outline what these kids should be doing and at what ages they should be doing them to help kind of decrease the pressures on them to specialize. So the first, phase of the framework um, is kids should be learning the fundamentals. They should be learning the ABCs, the agility, the balance, and the coordination. And this stage should happen between six to 10 years old. Phase two is the training to train. And this is the part where they learn how to train and they learn the basic skills of the sport they would like to play. And that should happen between 10 to 14 years old. The third step is training to compete. At this point, 50% of your time should be spent in the skill and 50% should be spent in competition. And that should happen between 12 to 18 year olds. The fourth step is training to win. 
At this point, 75% of your time should be spent in competition and 25% should be spent in the skill and their training to optimize performance. And this phase should include anyone greater than or equal to 17 years old. In the fifth phase, it means that you have retired from your sport and you're no longer competing. And so the whole purpose of this program is that you're increasing the percent of time you spend in competition slowly so that kids don't get the burnout and the overuse and eventually complete withdrawal from the sport. I believe so, yes, um, yep. We would hope so. We would hope that that's how it's yeah. happening. Um, ideally, ideally yeah. yes. I mean, even, even with this framework, you could see the specialization with the framework um, and just one athlete competing in the one sport, but we're hoping that if people are using this framework, that they're spending time in all the sports and at the same level and at the same phases. The second model that I wanted to talk about was developed in 2014 by the U.S. Olympic Committee. And it's a very similar process. It does involve five different phases. Phase one is the discover, learn, and play from zero to 12-year-olds. Phase two is develop and challenge from 10 to 16. Phase three is train and compete from 13 to 19. Phase four is excel in high performance and participate and succeed, greater than or equal to 15-year-olds. And phase five, the, just like the other, is the mentor and thrive, and that means that competition has stopped. I'm going to talk about a little bit about specialization and the effects it has in the athletes' bodies. Um, young athletes who participate in, vari in a variety of sports have fewer injuries and play sports longer than those who specialize before puberty. Specializing in a single, single sport causes imbalances in parts of the body due to repetitive motion using the same muscle group over and over with increased intensity and volume. Some of the common injuries seen in athletes who specialize are tendonitis, uh, stress fractures, and sprains. Tendonitis is an inflammation of a tendon um, which is commonly caused by repetition of the same movement over time. Stress fractures is when there are tiny cracks in the bone that usually um, caused by repetitive stress or force, often from overuse. Sprains, um, it's stretching or tearing of ligaments that can occur at any joint when it exceeds normal range of motion or repetitive stress over time. Common sports specialized in and the injuries associated. Um, ice hockey shows an increase in labrum tears due to the possible repetitive trauma or repetitive motion um, in the sport that causes damage to the cartilage that lines the rim of the hip socket. In soccer, the most common lower extremity, lower extremity injury uh, was knee tendonitis. In my research, it primarily affected uh, those who had weak hips, quads, and hamstrings. Swimming, shoulder impingement occurred um, when the tendons and or bursa has increased inflammation due to the small space and repetitive motion. And then in baseball, due to repetitive motion, um, they have a higher risk of tendonitis or sprains of the elbow. Some tips for pre preventing um, overuse injuries, correct improper technique. Student athletes should never skip a rest day. Um, they need a physical and mental break to fully recover. Um, also, cross-training allows those muscles that always get used to have a break and switches up your child's workout. Um, and then strive to improve flexibility and core strength. So what are the social and emotional aspects of, of sports specialization? I, I, in my time as an athletic trainer, there is a huge increase in the emotional health and the social health of, of athletes. I did not realize 11 years ago that I would do so much counseling, if you will. Um, I think we would all agree that the 
the um, sports psychology part of our background is something that I didn't know that I was going to need or use as much on a daily basis. I feel like there are days when I can, or times when I can go days at a time without doing something orthopedic in nature, but have multiple kids that come because they need a sounding board. And, and I, we seem to be that sounding board for them. So what, what are they going through? There's, there's a ton of emotional stress on these athletes. They feel that they need to get a scholarship. A scholarship is their only way that they can, can pay for college. So they have to pick a sport and they have to be the best at it. And being the best at it means I can only play that sport and I have to play on three different teams and my high school team. And I must, must go, go, go with one sport. Doing that can potentially lead to burnout. Burnout is the multidimensional psychological syndrome of reduced sense of athletic accomplishment, sport devaluation, and physical and emotional exhaustion. These kids are doing so much of their sport in so many different teams and levels and, and arenas that they don't care anymore. They don't get excited when they accomplish things because, hey, guess what? You did that on Friday. Well, you got to completely start all over and play with another team on Sunday and do just as, as well, if not better. They don't, they're physically and emotionally exhausted, be it from injury or just trying to juggle schoolwork, a social life, and then three different sports teams and three different practice schedules. They're physically and emotionally exhausted, all leading to a lack of motivation because they just can't do it anymore, causing them to absolutely just quit the sport and quit athletics in, in general. Mental health concerns, mental health has become a major issue that is impacting our young athletes during their development. Um, researchers have proclaimed that between 10 and 20 of the youth are affected by mental illness such as anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. This number continues to grow with the external pressures that the youth are under with social media, peers, school, sports, etc. With, with social media today, which could be a whole other topic that we could discuss for, for hours, your, your Instagram self is not your true self, but you have to look good on Instagram. You have to put forth this, I've got it all together. I'm on top of my schoolwork. I'm the captain of my team. And kids are, are concerned and, and very much feel the pressure of that. The scary part with the mental disorders um, in youth today is that only one in five children who actually need the mental health services will actually get the services that they need. Mental health is still very taboo, especially in kids. They will try to hide it so that they feel the same as their peers. They don't want to be alienated or seen as different or think that there's something wrong with them or have the stigma of, hey, that kid's crazy. They keep all this bottled in and unfortunately that can lead to, to suicide. In, in the adolescent population. All of that being said though, sports, sports are great. They're a, they do have an absolutely positive influence on kids. They're great for their development, but people have to understand that there is a negative correlation if they're not done properly or participated in correctly. So those negative effects, sorry, can be they're training too hard, and trying to maintain a healthy diet, which we think, hey, that's a great thing, but it then crosses the line into exhaustion and eating disorders because they have to eat the right thing to optimally perform and they're monitoring their diet so strictly. Encouraging players to do their best can slip into pushing players to the point of injury or harm. Kids feel that they have to be on top of everything and so and excel so much that they don't realize hey, I need to take a break, or hey, I've got to say, just can't today, I'm hurt. Kids will come and say, please don't tell the coach that I, that I came to see you, to the point that there's going to further an injury or, or cause harm. It's not as much of an issue now, it has definitely become less of uh, um, an issue than it used to be, but attempts at team bonding can unfortunately at times morph into a bullying or a hazing situation. But again, sports are a great thing. So the positive effects of the sport participation, youth can bond with peers, you make new friends, maybe you are new to a school or just want to expand your group of friends, you decide that you wanna go out for, for a team or go out for multiple teams. It's going to give you different groups of friends, it gives you um, 
a way to pursue an interest for the physical benefits. It's going to make you, has an increased likelihood to make you a lifelong exerciser if you start participating in sports, or even just a distraction. A lot of kids will participate in sports and participate in many sports just so they don't have to go home to a not great situation. They use it as a way to get rid of some of their nervous energy to give them something to do so that they're not getting in trouble. Being on different teams gives you different groups of friends. You play soccer with your friends in the fall and then spring rolls around and you play with a different group of friends on the softball team. And like I said before, exercise will enhance your psychological well-being. It'll <clears throat> enhance your feelings of control, improve your self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-efficacy, and um, give you the opportunity to create more positive social, social interactions in your life. Okay, to continue our discussion, we thought it would be beneficial to um, somewhat look at the po different points of view in this subject. So points of view in regard to what the athletes are thinking and going through, what coaches are thinking, what parents are thinking. So we're gonna um, kind of look at each of those uh, people. So overall, some common perceptions of parents, coaches, and athletes are that most of them do not seek out scientific information regarding sport participation, um, any part of it. Um, and so the assumption is um, obviously that more time with a specific sport equals higher success. Many feel pressure, uh, or they, excuse me, may feel pressure for athletes to succeed, to gain college scholarships, and also for recognition of the athletic program they're involved in. They typically are not well educated on overuse injuries and also mental health concerns. So as Carrie spoke about earlier in the injury section, baseball players are susceptible to elbow injuries more so than other sports. So the primary concern with elbows in baseball players is an ulnar ligament injury um, resulting in surgery. So you may have heard about Tommy John surgery. That's what we're talking about. So the number of these cases has skyrocketed at the youth level despite high school and associations um, encouraging or um, promoting putting into place pitch counts. So one of the statistics that I found that was really eye-opening is that 30% of baseball coaches 37% of parents, 51% of high school athletes, and 26% of collegiate athletes believe that Tommy John surgery should be performed prophylactically on athletes without elbow injury to improve performance. So we can kind of correlate this back to the fact that they're not looking into scientific research on the subject and they're not well versed on injuries. Um, because obviously, you know, to put your athlete under a surgery that they do not need at that time, at least, um, obviously surgeries all have risks, as we know. Um, and then on top of that, it is a lengthy period of time taken off from their sport um, in a lengthy recovery and rehab process. And then on top of that, um, similar numbers of these same people do not believe that pitch count is a risk factor for elbow injury. And the research shows that pitch, ca pitch counts are often um, not followed, especially when athletes are participating in their high school team and then on multiple um, club or youth teams because the pitch counts don't correlate um, and aren't kind of followed through all of those um, leagues. So from the parent perspective, many parents want their kids to be active regardless of what activity they're participating in. And so many parents aren't aware um, of what sports specialization actually is. Parents who play or played a specific sport often look for their children to follow in their footsteps and may not expose their children to other activities or other sports. And they also may not have realistic goals for athletes' athletic career. As Courtney spoke about earlier, you know, there is a very low number of athletes that achieve um, an athletic career beyond high school, and obviously many more fewer than that that um, would participate at the professional level. From the coach's perspective, uh, most coaches are knowledgeable at least about what sport specialization is, but they often feel that their sport is the best and feel that more time with their athletes does equal a higher success rate. And they feel that practicing the same, excuse me, the same skills over and over would result in mastery of those skills. 
So we looked um, kind of all over social media, the internet, um, as well as reaching out um, to some colleagues. And some of the quotes that we found that really hit home were, uh, with us are, um, we did see that the head strength coach at Kansas State um, is quoted as saying that the worst thing that is happening today is sports specialization. And then the head football coach at Arkansas says, I want players that play multiple sports. It develops an overall skill set. It shows that they can be coached in different ways. If I have a player that is dead equal and one plays one sport and the other plays two sports, I'm going to go after the two sport athlete first. Um, we did reach out to some colleagues of ours because we wanted to get quotes from coaches outside of the general Coffer County area, so outside of coaches that we work with on a daily basis. And so um, a, a high school soccer coach outside of the state of Pennsylvania um, that, I, that reached um, kind of back to me said, I have seen studies that show the most qualified athletes compete in a variety of different sports. Personally, as a coach, I like girls that play soccer year-round, but I don't encourage them to quit other sports. So as we can see, the coaches seem to know what sports specialization is. They seem to know that there might be a little bit of research out there that says maybe it's not the best, but they still do have that mindset that they want their athletes with them the majority of the time playing their sport. And then the Pittsburgh Pirates GM did come out and say, it's a huge positive for a high school player to be a multi-sport athlete. They tend to be more athletic, better leaders, and better teammates. Single sport athletes tend to have a higher burnout rate and or appear to have lost some of the passion for the game because it was all they knew before it became their profession. So looking at it from an athlete perspective, um, we talked a little bit earlier, but they uh, may feel pressure from their parents, friends, or coaches. They may feel pulled in too many directions from outside feedback. Current adolescents are generally more stressed in general than previous generations. And their time may be so constrained with organized sports that they have no time left for true play. So we're seeing less and less kids who are playing pickup basketball games at the park, kickball in a friend's backyard in the neighborhood, um, and just general group play. So we did find some quotes from professional athletes that um, really spoke to sports specialization and how they're seeing it. So JJ Watt, who's an NFL football player, um, if someone encourages your child to specialize in a single sport, that person generally does not have your child's best interest in mind. Also a football player, Drew Brees, you name a sport, I probably played it. I think kids specialize too soon. Kids should be playing as many sports for as long as they possibly can. All the sports combined is what makes you the athlete that you are, and eventually you will have to specialize. But once that time comes, you will greatly, excuse me, you will benefit greatly from all of those sports you played. An NBA player, Steph Curry, said, my experience with playing different sports is it taught me a little bit more about myself. Knowing I wasn't as good at baseball or football as basketball, it challenged me to gain that confidence and gain that work ethic to get better. Also a good note is that only 22.3% of professional athletes said that they would want their own child to specialize to play a single sport during childhood. So we are very fortunate in our area to have some elite athletes come um, from our area and we are fortunate to have good relationships with them and they were willing to answer some questions for us on this subject. So um, we are going to look at two different athletes that we spoke with um, and they very much had two different um, journeys um, into their athletic career. So the first athlete we're going to look at um, is Spencer Lee. He previously wrestled at Sagertown before he transferred to Franklin regional um, for his high school career. He is a current true freshman wrestler at Iowa. He is a three-time PIAA state wrestling champion and he lost his only high school match in the state final his senior year wrestling on a severe knee injury. He is a three-time freestyle wrestling world champion. He was chosen as the only high school wrestling training partner in the 2016 Summer Olympics. He was last year the number one wrestling recruit in the country. And he is widely noted as one of the best wrestlers in the world, and he does have a realistic goal of being an Olympic wrestler. Um, we also spoke with Journey Brown, who is a 2017 graduate of Meadville High School, where he played football, basketball, and track and field. He is a current member of the Penn State football team. 
He is a two-time PIAA 100-meter dash champion, and in that event, he broke an Olympic gold medalist record. So one of the first questions we asked was what they looked like growing up as an athlete. So Spencer, um, even though he obviously specialized, as we'll see in a minute, um, he did play s different sports as he was growing up. So he participated in cross country, football, soccer, wrestling, and baseball. And he did begin specializing in wrestling around um, eighth grade, which was age 13, 14. Journey um, participated in soccer, football, wrestling, basketball, and track and field growing up. He was a three sport athlete in high school, so he did not specialize. Um, and he notes that he spent equal time on each sport throughout his high school career. <clears throat> So we wanted to know what other activities or hobbies they had um, or have. So Spencer says that at this point and really since the time he specialized, he really didn't have any time for any other sports or hobbies outside of wrestling. He was an avid reader as an adolescent um, and he did note that he enjoys spending time with friends and video games. Journey says um, he was kind of participating in sports all the time um, and so he did not have any other significant activities outside of sports. So we wanted to talk about uh, kind of how much they were training um, and it, whether they had any off time. As we spoke about earlier, um, that was kind of a benefit to athletes who specialize um, and athletes at all having some off time. So Spencer notes that once he specialized in wrestling, so again, around the age of 13 or 14, um, he did spend about 35 hours plus um, just on wrestling per week. Um, he did say that he took about two to three weeks off a year every year, um, or excuse me, two to three weeks off um, throughout the year right after the World Championships. So that was really his own, only true rest time um, for the year. Journey spent about 20 hours a week, give or take, um, dedicated to sports, and he said, again, he was kind of playing sports year-round, um, different sports all the time, so he didn't have any significant off time specifically from sports. <clears throat> So we asked whether they um, had any other aspects of life suffer or whether they were helped by sports. So Spencer acknowledges that he has made many friends through wrestling. He does think that his grades could suffer. Um, his quote was, even though school is my main priority, when you have Big Tens or Nationals or a paper due, I'm going to choose winning NCAAs or just getting the paper finished. So if you don't know, those are some big tournaments in the um, college wrestling uh, world. And those are realistic goals for him. So um, he, he does, at this point, continue to be an excellent student. He has been his entire adolescence. Um, he also notes that he hasn't recognized any uh, mental health issues or any burnout. Journey feels that, as, um, that his time has been balanced well and his life has not changed really in regard to the sports he's participated in. He did recognize that he felt a bit of burnout in regard to participating in a sport that he liked and really was kind of participating for the benefit of being with friends, but he didn't really love it. So he did say that that kind of burned him out a bit. So in regard to injuries, uh, Spencer has had two major injuries and surgeries, one to the shoulder and one to the knee. He does not feel that being a multi-sport athlete would have stopped these injuries from happening. He feels they would have occurred anyway. Journey said um, he has had no major injuries, but does feel that he was injury prone because it is the nature of playing sports. So in regard to competitive advantage um, in college recruitment, Spencer is quoted as saying, yes, I live and breathe this sport and they do it part time. I've never lost to a multi-sport athlete. And again, as we talked about at the very beginning, he was the number one wrestling recruit in the nation. Journey says, I'm a better athlete because I played multiple sports. I was able to pick up different mindsets and learn from different coaches because of playing different sports. Coaches felt I was a better athlete because I was a multiple sport athlete. It showed my athleticism. I was able to adapt to different things and most schools liked that I played multiple sports. So we wanted to know what they thought, um, kind of putting their specific situation aside, but um, kind of grasping, you know, what, what would they think or what would they tell a normal, um, you know, kind of everyday average youth athlete. 
So Spencer says, everyone's opinions differ. I believe if you want to be the absolute best at your sport, eventually you need to choose. But that may be just with my size and my sport. Football, for example, if I was 6'5 and 235 pounds, I'd do track, wrestling, and football because they all benefit football. I'm very flexible to prevent injuries, so maybe gymnastics for wrestling. Journey said, for the average kid, I would recommend playing multiple sports. If you do go to college to play a sport, it will, be, it will probably just be one sport, so have fun while you can. He also noted that he used sports to get to know different coaches and friends and thought that was a benefit. I feel like all athletes in high school should play all sports they can because it's only four years. Do as many as you can so it's not a shoulda, woulda, coulda situation. I got mad at my friends who were good athletes and didn't use their talents in other sports. So that last quote he really wanted us to include. Um, and I also want to point out um, wrestling, as we talked about earlier, is a sport with a high rate of specialization, just the nature of the sport. Um, football really is not because there aren't many opportunities to participate in football year round. There aren't the club leagues um, and other things that wrestling has. So, um, but as you can see from this slide, Spencer does at least acknowledge that um, if um, there was a complementary sport, then he would think for the average athlete that it would be beneficial, even if that athlete chooses to specialize. <clears throat> so their personal decisions for why they chose the path of sports that they did. Spencer specialized because um, I wanted to be a world NCAA and Olympic champ and other sports got in, a, got in the way. And again, um, as we talked about before, that is kind of a realistic expectation for him, um, not necessarily a realistic expectation for the average athlete. Um, Journey played multiple sports because his coaches promoted playing multiple sports. His friends convinced him to be able to spend more time together. His football coach also promoted being active in the off season. He also said, I'm fast, so I ran track and I can jump high, so I played basketball. And both of those translated to his football career. So we want to say thank you for allowing us to bring awareness to the specialization subject, um, especially during National Athletic Training Month. We all love sports. We would absolutely not do this profession if we didn't love them, um, but we hope that this information is um, going to provide an avenue for open and meaningful discussions on sports specialization in our adolescent population. Are there any questions? So when I was in high school in sports, the, the coach, well, we need you in our off-season program because they were afraid you were going to get hurt in another sport. Does that still, I mean, is that still a thing? Does that still go on? Mm -hmm. No coach would admit that that actually goes on, but I, I mean, I do think that definitely off-season training and conditioning shows a huge benefit to keeping kids in shape for the, for the season coming up. Um, but there are some that would say, I, I want you here instead of there. I think it's important to note that none of us throughout this presentation, we hope that the, the, um, we hope that what we didn't, you know, promote in this was that you should play baseball and then do nothing the rest of the year. Um, we aren't saying that we certainly agree. I think all agree that cross training is really important. So specifically to your question, if the quote, you know, if we're talking about a volleyball athlete and they want them to do specifically volleyball conditioning, um, outside of volleyball season, um, not necessarily ideal because that volleyball conditioning is, you know, certainly going to still use the same body parts that they're using during the volleyball season. And we're really hoping that, you know, um, athletes are getting kind of an overall conditioning instead of just using the same muscles that they're using throughout their season. Um, so I think it's really important to note that we want athletes to be active year round, um, obviously with some dedicated off time as we spoke about, but um, really promoting using, um, you know, kind of lower body if their sport primarily uses upper body and vice versa. So I have a question um, related to the two athletes that you presented. I really like that compare and contrast. Um, I marvel at the Spencer who is doing 35 hours related to his athletic endeavors at a time when he's going to school and has to live. That's like a full-time job. So how do they sleep, drink, eat, live, and go to school um, with those, that type of commitment? Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking to, to a high school age athlete, 
they don't, you know, if you're putting that much time in, you're going to school seven to three, then that math is roughly five hours of sport practice. That's 8 p.m. Then they still have to come home, try to do homework. And, and I think we would agree across the board though, student athletes are very well organized. They know how to manage their time. It's just something innate in them. But I know that I will have athletes just in the nature of the way education is nowadays that they'll tell me, Brie, I was up till two o'clock in the morning trying to get all my homework done. Mm -hmm. Just because the amount of homework that they have. So there's not a lot of time for, for extra things, but they want to do those extra things. And that's where they get that kind of like social anxiety that I should be home doing my history paper, but I really need to go to the basketball game to make an appearance or to see my friends because there's so there's no unstructured time for them. They have to be very structured um, in a detrimental way that there's no unstructured time. And I think a lot of that leads to the burnout and the overuse and the wanting to quit. And so I think that, that it all plays a huge role altogether. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to realize specifically with Spencer, we're we were able to speak with him and he is an athlete that has gotten to that next level. Um, and speaking, having known him kind of in his adolescence is, you know, he kind of had all of his stuff together and was a very good student and had, you know, a good support system and all of that. And I think it's very important to realize that if he didn't have that and wasn't, you know, a good student and didn't kind of have his ducks in a row and be able to schedule himself that, we wouldn't be talking to him because he wouldn't have gotten to that level. And so I think the vast majority of athletes that maybe would have made the same decision as him without all of that um, kind of support on the base of it wouldn't have gotten to his level. So I think it's important to note that he's an anomaly and a fantastic anomaly, but I don't think, and you know, even he says that is probably not realistic for kind of the average, you know, athlete that we're talking about. So as this is happening nationwide, who's having those honest conversations? Do you have conversations with your athletes that you see going down a path and say, whatever percentage of it is, and 0 0.03 to 0.05% of athletes from high school on to college or on to professional sports, like who's helping to reset what's realistic for the majority of these kids? Because one of you made a comment that it was um, the athlete's career, and I guess as a parent, any parent whose child in high school, their career is not their path, mm -hmm. athletic. So who's, who's having those conversations, or based on what you're finding, it's turning to you? I think that it is turning to us. I mean, I know mm -hmm. that I specifically had a, had a conversation like that um, with, a, with an athlete of mine very recently, and... and in, in that, I'm trying HIPAA, you know, <laughs> um, they are a single sport athlete that does play year round and she's seeing me for a reason, if you get my drift there, because there's no cross training even involved. And, and like Whitney said, I only played one sport in high school. Carrie only played one sport in high school, but we didn't. We weren't specialized in one sport. I just chose to play one sport, and that's okay. We're not saying that you should be playing three to four sports just to not be a specialist, but but there has to be off time and, and cross training and you know core workouts that are just good for you, just good skills for you to develop for lifelong physical fitness, not just the blip on the screen that your high school years are they're great years and they're important but really they are a blip mm -hmm. in in the scheme of your life and it's it's hard because pretty much all the research articles that we looked at um, are saying that you know the specialization you know that occurs before puberty which is basically you know kind of the the major you know when we're talking sports specialization kind of the the, the major sports specialization is those kids that are starting super, super early um, is really, you know, the research is saying that that really is kind of started by the parents urging them or thinking that that's the best. And then it continues because then the coach 
perpetuates that that's the best. So, you know, we see our athletes every day, but we don't necessarily, you know, have all the time with them, you know, that their specific coach does. So I have an athlete right now that probably just three months ago, I had a, 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 um, another coach and a teacher come to me and say, you know, I really wanted him to play football, but he only wants to participate in this one sport. And he said, he has to do this sport. And if he doesn't do this sport consistently, he will not get better. Um, and so then when I mentioned kind of in passing, just to kind of open up the conversation, it was very much, I have to do this sport all the time or I will not get better. I will not get better if I don't do this all the time. Absolutely cannot do anything else. And, you know, kind of broaching that subject with a parent, you kind of have to understand what you're getting into sometimes too, because they often have that mindset. And again, going back to kind of what we talked about is they don't necessarily seek out information um, that might go against their current mindset. So that's been a little bit difficult too, specifically with some of my athletes. Well, thanks guys, that was great. Okay, so think it over. Um, should your kid just be in one sport or is it better for them to be in multiple sports? Uh, my, my personal take is get them in multiple sports. I think that's a great thing. Well, thanks for joining us today on Medicine Meadville and we'll talk to you next time.